Good morning, everybody. Um, we welcome you to this virtual seminar on evidence, ethics, and the emergency use of unproven interventions for COVID-19. I am Carla Sainz, and Bajos Regional Bioethics Advisor. And today, my colleague Ludovic Reves, uh, Regional Advisor on Evidence in Public Health, is going to be uh, presenting on the evidence component, and I'm going to follow his presentation on the ethics component. Dr. Reves is responsible at PAHO Incident Management System uh, of the topics pertaining to evidence and research. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we, will, um, we will take all your questions through the chat function and, um, and the session will be recorded and will be made available later. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, pass the mic to Dr. Reves. Thank you. Okay, so good morning, uh, everyone. So I'm going to present a very brief update on treatment protocols. So as you probably know, the clinical presentation of COVID-19 ranges from asymptomatic to fulminant and fatal. Uh, patients can be classified as asymptomatic or having mild, uh, moderate, severe, or critical disease. And uh, while most people with COVID-19 develop only mild or moderate disease, approximately 50% have severe disease that requires oxygen support. And 5% uh, develop critical disease with complications such as resp respiratory failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome, sepsis and septic shock, thromboembolism, multi-organ failure, uh, which includes also acute uh, kidney uh, injury or liver injury or also cardiac injury. So there are three clinical stages that have been identified based on viral infection, pulmonary involvement with inflammation and fibrosis, and therapeutics under uh, research uh, frequently target these stages. In addition, um, most hospitalized patients infected uh, uh, have comorbidities uh, and a, dispropor a disproportionate proportion of hospitalization and death take place in minority and low-income po uh, populations. So the scientific community um, has focused on developing and proposing uh, interventions that can target SARS-CoV-2. Uh, at this time, as you know, there are more than 200 intervention or coordinations of those interventions that are being investigated in more than 2,500 studies, at least uh, those that are included and re uh, registered. And those studies include also the evaluation in prophylaxis. So, these interventions uh, currently under study include several antiviral drugs, so, such as remdesivir, favipiravir, immunomodulators, antibiotics, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, vitamins, convalescent plasma, and many, many other interventions. And as you can see from the slide, uh, researchers have frequently focused on investigating the same interventions and there are more than 100 of those interventions that only have one or two small sample size trials. And, and this is, uh, uh, of course, problematic because um, th there is a focus on, on, on few of those interventions in many countries. And once you have uh, results from a larger trials, then all those studies uh, are stopped or, or and, and then they don't they are not focused on on all the other uh, possible interventions that could be investigated so as i was saying unfortunately few high quality randomized control trials having larger sample size are ongoing or have reported results and this is an important limitation of uh, the current research uh, as high quality larger collaborative studies are needed to establish benefit and arms of, of these interventions. Um, 
as you, uh, you, you have seen that uh, the studies that provide uh, results on uh, uh, significant results on benefit and harm are usually usually in, have incorporated uh, more than 1,000 uh, patients or, or participants per arm. And uh, and then, so if you want to really identify uh, significant results for those uh, critical um, outcomes, you really need to have a larger sample size. And if you are just developing small studies, uh, then you won't be able to to identify it, uh, if those interventions really have some benefits on, and uh, specifically. So. The organization is continuously developing and publishing uh, systematic reviews of, of almost 30 treatment options on their study. Uh, from this large large list that, that I presented of more than 200 interventions or combinations, we have prioritized a number of those and we have then uh, follow up uh, research conducted in in vitro that is reported in in vitro studies observational studies or clinical trials in, in particular randomized control trials and based on this finding most available randomized control trials evaluating the effectiveness of interventions in covid-19 patients are of low quality and have shown no benefit in reducing mortality and other critical outcomes so we have uh, the emerging data that was uh, recently published that indicate that dexamethasone uh, therapy significantly reduce uh, mortality in COVID-19 patients requiring supplemental oxygen or that are intubated. As an example, we have pulled here data from all randomized control trials evaluating the use of corticosteroids for reducing mortality in acute respiratory distress syndrome in COVID and non-COVID patients. And we have found consistent results with those from the recovery trial, which, which is the larger trial and have evaluated dexamethasone. So um, we have a, a larger list of uh, other studies that have uh, random mass control trials. And, but so far there is no uh, significant mortality reduction. Uh, although in remdesivir, uh, there are very interesting uh, results and probably larger uh, additional studies will provide a larger sample size that, that will really clarify the significance of mortality reduction. Uh, so PAHO and WHO have developed guidelines for the management of patients that are, are updated regularly based on existing evidence. Uh, PAHO's method to develop recommendation considered the balance between the benefit and the safety of the interventions, the feasibility of implementation, uh, the cost, values and preference of patients and users, and equity issues among other aspects. And we have established um, a panel of intensive care and other um, specialists that uh, provide uh, the recommendations to and and then we we can uh, formulate the recommendation based on their uh, on their expertise and of course on all, all the evidence that is produced. So based on this uh, guidelines, patients with mild disease should be given symptomatic treatment. There is currently no evidence supporting the use of medications to prevent complications in mild or moderate patients. Uh, patients with moderate COVID-19 should be monitored closely for signs or symptoms of disease progression, and this is really something uh, very important to monitor and to identify also patients that are at higher risk. Uh, the safety of persons with COVID-19 is of high importance given the current situation. We have noticed that in, in many, in many uh, countries, patients often older adults or with pre-existing conditions are receiving multiple drug combination without consideration of possible adverse events or interactions. Also, approximately 20% of hospitalized patients with COVID-19 experience severe symptoms necessitating intensive care and more than 75% 
of hospitalized patients require supplemental oxygen. Uh, so PAHO's clinical practice guideline provide evidence for recommendation for infection control, specimen collection, supportive care, pharmacological treatment, and prevention of uh, complications. We are currently updating uh, the version that was published uh, some weeks ago, and it will be uh, published very soon, and we, it will also include recommendation for rehabilitation, and it will incorporate all the evidence that we have uh, integrated in the last uh, weeks. So some final uh, considerations that I would like to highlight. Uh, the situation regarding evidence for anti-COVID treatment is highly fluid and changing by the day. Uh, the organization is closely monitoring the situation and will immediately inform uh, countries in the, if the risk-benefit profile of these uh, interventions change. Uh, the organization promotes the institutionalization of rapid response mechanisms to rapidly translate scientific evidence into policy and practice in member states. And one uh, key issue that I will uh, specifically want to highlight is that the safety of of a person with COVID-19 should be a primary objective in ensuring quality of care when delivering health services. Also, uh, the PAHO's list of essential drugs and med medical devices for care is available to guide countries to invest available resources to improve the level of care. And finally, it is really important to follow formal processes to incorporate drugs and health technologies in, into health systems to aid in the COVID-19 response. So thank you very much. and. Uh, over Carla. Thank you so much, uh, Ludovic. I've uh, shared some um, uh, some links to some of the documents that Ludovic has mentioned in the chat, and we're going to proceed now with the ethics part. And I'm sharing also in the chat a link uh, to the document that we're mostly discussing today. So. In standard circumstances, this is what we have. In a research setting, we prove if interventions are safe and efficacious. And in that setting, in the research setting, we have a number of safeguards to protect participants. Another, uh, uh, another different setting is clinical practice. So in the clinical practice setting, we give patients interventions that have previously been proven to be safe and efficacious. So if we are proving something, we talk about it's a research setting and comes with safeguards for participants. And in the, cl in the clinical practice se setting, we're not proving things. We already proved uh, um, these interventions previously. So what we're seeing in the context uh, of the pandemic and what we've seen in prior emergencies is a scenario like this, where we have the research setting, the clinical practice setting, but we also encounter something that's different. So what we see is that unproven interventions are being provided outside of research settings. That is, without the safeguards that we use uh, in research settings to protect participants. So many of you are wondering, uh, from an ethics perspective, how should we assess this pink box? Is it, is it ethical? Is it ethically acceptable to give people unproven interventions uh, without uh, uh, being part of a research setting and without all the protections that come with a research uh, setting? This is the focus of this uh, talk. And uh, so I'm going to mostly be presenting uh, this publication of uh, PAHO on the emergency use of, uh, um, of in interventions that are unproven and uh, that are being provided outside of the context of research for COVID-19. The quick answer to the question in the previous slide is that even considering the exceptional circumstances of the emergency, it is only 
ethically acceptable to give unproven interventions outside of research if certain specific conditions are met. This condition, this is not the first time in history when we're facing this ethically challenging situation. You may remember that in the context of uh, Ebola, we dealt with a similar question and, uh, and the, the conclusions of the ethics assessment uh, that was established there are captured in WHO's publication that I include their guidance for managing ethical issues in infectious disease and outbreaks. And PAHO's publication uh, further elaborates on that, on that and provides clarification to uh, implement these ethical considerations. So what we want to highlight is that it is just not true that since it's an emergency, anything is okay, anything goes. So what I will present to you is what's called, uh, uh, since the Ebola outbreak, the MURI framework, um, we labeled it back then. MURI stands for Monitored Emergency Use of Use of Unregistered and Experimental Interventions. Uh, this is a framework in which interventions that are unproven are being provided to patients with a view to their benefit. And I say a view because unlike the normal clinical setting, we do not know if the interventions uh, that are being offered can benefit them or not because those uh, um, interventions are unproven. So we provide them with a view of their benefit with, um, to attempt to benefit them, uh, but at the same time, we ensure that some key data are being collected. So um, in a nutshell, it can be ethical to provide unproven interventions uh, in the context of of an emergency, providing that some very specific conditions are met. And we're going to discuss those conditions now. I want to highlight before we move to, that, to the conditions, the ethical imperatives that we have to conduct clinical trials to find out which interventions are safe and efficacious. And that providing inter unproven interventions uh, outside research settings as part of the MURI framework should not detract us from this ethical imperative. The priority should be to conduct clinical trials, which because only clinical trials can answer the research questions that are urgent at this moment, as Dr. Revey highlighted. So the seven ethical criteria that are necessary for uh, um, for unproven interventions to be ethically acceptable outside of research settings during emergency pertain to four different categories. The first category is the justification of the intervention that covers requirements uh, one to three. The second one is the ethical and regulatory oversight addresses the next two uh, um, criteria. Then we have the consent process. And then another uh, um, uh, topic is the contribution to the generation of evidence. So regarding the justification, three criteria must be met. First, that no, no proven effective treatment exists, and Dr. Reves has addressed uh, uh, the current landscape already. Uh, second, that it is not possible to initiate clinical studies immediately, and um, it's increasingly, increasingly hard to make that claim, given, as Dr. Reves has shown, the wide scope of uh, clinical trials that are being conducted already in our region. Third, that there's data that actually justifies the use of this intervention uh, outside of research setting. That is, there's some preliminary support uh, uh, for their efficacy. And uh, there's a qualified scientific committee that has proposed its use, that it's provided outside of clinical trials based on a favorable risk-benefit analysis. And as you heard Dr. Reis explain, at this point, uh, taking into account the risk-benefit analysis and, um, and on the basis of the most updated uh, uh, evidence, um, the Pan-American Health Organization, WHO, are not uh, supporting 
are not recommending the use outside of clinical trials of a number of interventions that are being provided. Um, with respect to the ethical and regulatory oversight, two criteria apply. One of them, one of them is the approval of a relevant country of the relevant country authorities, and that's primarily the national regulatory authorities. But that can be there can be other relevant uh, authorities, for example, in the case of convalescent plasma, and also the approval of an appropriately qualified ethics committee. We think that the adequately qualified ethics committee is actually a research ethics committee, because despite the fact that this um, that these interventions are provided outside of research settings, as you will see, we we need a protocol that um, to assess their justification, and we think that ethics review committees are the most appropriately situated uh, to do the necessary uh, review, ethics review of this intervention. Uh, and another criteria under this uh, uh, theme is uh, the, um, that adequate resources are available to ensure that risk can be minimized. For example, that that the interventions are, uh, for example, if it's a drug that it's a say it's a, it's a drug that is uh, um, um, that it, that that we know that it's uh, properly regulated in the sense that it's not like. Um, it's not a version that, that the national regulatory authority considers uh, unsafe, or it's, uh, for example, if we're talking about plasma, that it's safe plasma that's being provided. With respect to the consent process, uh, a key criteria is that the patient provides their consent voluntarily. Yes, that's redundant. Consent presupposes voluntariness. And the patient, uh, in order to provide voluntary consent, has been informed that the intervention is unproven. Just like in any um, other uh, situation in which consent is relevant uh, for, um, for COVID patients, we have uh, provisions to ensure that another person provides the consent if the patient himself is not able to do so. There may be someone like a family member, and uh, we uh, endorse the same criteria to make, uh, to make uh, consent um, to make consent feasible in the situation of the pandem pandemia, as we've discussed in the context of research. We want to highlight, though, that we think that community engagement is essential in this circumstance. We envision that a number of patients that are being offered these interventions uh, uh, might be offered those interventions at a moment that are not conscious or not able to make decisions. So it'd be ideal to have uh, um, to inform widely the community about the interventions that are being offered uh, that are unproven and are being offered outside of a research setting. And also, uh, not just to inform which these interventions are, but also their uh, limited uh, um, potential benefit and the risk. Finally, uh, uh, the last criteria pertains to the contribution to the generation of evidence. So even if it is the case that this intervention is provided outside of research settings, because it's an emergency situation, we have the moral duty to contribute to the generation of evidence. So that implies that the, the use, this emergency use, must be monitored, some data must be obtained, and results are being documented and shared in a timely manner with the wider medical and scientific community. So this presupposes some coordination uh, with the relevant health authorities um, so uh, um, to do uh, the sharing and to uh, motivate action immediately. So um, you may be wondering if we're, if we're meeting these seven criteria out. And the truth is that uh, this is a case. Carla, we can't hear you. Thank you. Is it better like that? Yes. Great, thanks, Ludovic. This is a framework that was developed in the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, and uh, we ha since certainly we had the, the Zika uh, outbreak in 2015 and 16. Uh, yes, I think yes, 2015 and 16. However, we were not uh, uh, faced with a similar challenge then. 
So a main challenge that we have in the region is that we're not sufficiently familiar with this framework and with these seven requirements, uh, even if uh, um, they've been included in a number of uh, WHO publications, including, for example, the guidance for use of off-label medicines for uh, COVID-19 and a number of other documents of, of PAHO, uh, uh, there's still a lot of work to do to make sure that we implement this MURI framework in a rigorous manner. Uh, more specifically, what we're seeing uh, in our region is that there's uh, an unjustified use of unproven interventions, meaning that interventions are being offered that do not meet the three criteria uh, under the, the, the first three criteria under the justification team. We also see that there's a, in, uh, a commonly a lack of adequate ethical and regulatory oversight of this uh, emergency use of unproven interventions. Health authorities are not, uh, not always um, involved, not, not always aware, ethics reviews not always uh, obtained, ethics approval is not always uh, uh, obtained before providing these interventions. So we see a, um, a difficult landscape in that way, and that's why we think it's very important to, to uh, share this uh, criteria with you. And uh, in the document, we provide some general recommendations, and I wanna strongly highlight the extremely exceptional status of MURI. As I said, our primary duty is to conduct clinical trials that are able to uh, identify interventions that are safe and efficacious. So even in the exceptional circumstance of the pandemic, the interventions provided, uh, providing interventions under the MURI framework should be an exceptional situation. Uh, among our recommendations, we also highlight the need to strengthen uh, ethical and regulatory oversight and specifically to empower national authorities to, and, and ethics review committees to conduct uh, such oversight. As mentioned before, we highlight the need for community uh, engagement. And we also think it's imperative to be able to identify easily uh, which interventions are being offered as part of a clinical trial or as part of a research project, and which interventions are being offered uh, as part of this MURI framework. And we're encountering that while it's, it's a positive thing that many interventions offered uh, uh, under the MURI framework are being registered, the registries don't necessarily make it easy to distinguish that those interventions are uh, provided under MURI. So um, we also, in the document, include some more specific recommendations, for example, um, on, the, uh, on the scientific basis to justify an intervention provided under MURI. We consider that given the global nature of the pandemic, it is appropriate to, um, to take the recommendations of PAHO uh, and WHO as uh, recommendations of uh, adequate um, scientific committees. We also include um, some clarification of the basic components that the MURI protocol should include. They're listed in the document. We also provide uh, uh, some guidance on what exactly an uh, ethics review committee should review and how it has to conduct its oversight given that it is not a research uh, study, but it bears significantly similarities with it. Uh, we have specific recommendations uh, for the involvement of health authority and the evaluation that they need to conduct. Uh, primarily, we think that they should uh, indicate a time frame after which this intervention provided as uh, MURI should be considered to be uh, provided as part of a research protocol. Uh, as mentioned before, we have recommendations for the registry of MURI protocol with a view of being able to clearly identify which interventions are being provided uh, uh, as part of uh, MURI. And recommendations for the efficiency and coordination of the provision of the intervention that resemble what we've said in terms uh, um, for the research setting in terms of 
close coordination between advisory committees and national regulatory authorities, and possibly also conducting the review simultaneously as opposed to consecutively. And finally, uh, uh, some more specific uh, recommendations on how the intervention uh, needs to be monitored and what duties that implies for the healthcare professional that is responsible for the intervention and that has to report uh, uh, any relevant event to the health authority. So that is uh, the uh, document. You can uh, review it and we welcome your comments and questions. That, um, that slide includes some other uh, um, documents of the organization that Dr. Reves uh, uh, discussed. And we welcome your comments or question in, uh, questions through the chat. We um, we kindly ask you to use the chat instead of the Q&A function that uh, is uh, hard to follow from an interface. Thank you very much, and I welcome uh, your comments or questions. And I don't know, uh, Ludovic, if you want to say any final words before going to questions. No, Carla, thank you. Uh, this is a very um, interesting question that we have, have um, received. Uh, so you said, who should pay for this unproven intervention under MURI protocol? The patient, the institution, the health insurance? And it, I think it's very hard given the, the, um, the, the wildlife landscape with, in our region to uh, provide any univocal answer to this question. Uh, because, I mean, if, if there be a country where some unproven intervention is being uh, uh, recommended under the MURI framework by the National Health Authority, uh, there should be no reason why this should be uh, uh, treated in a way that's different from any other uh, intervention. But I think this goes beyond, beyond um, my specific area of expertise. And I said it, it's a the not, not necessarily all interventions provided under MURI are promoted by the National Health Authority. There can be some that are initiated by a, um, by say a healthcare provider, but they have to be submitted to the National Health Authority for their uh, uh, approval. Ludovic, I don't know if you want to add anything to this topic. No, I agree with you. It depends on the, there are so many different uh, uh, mechanisms in each one of the countries that it's really difficult to to get into that. Thank you. I don't um, see any other question. I'm going to just uh, wait a second. As I said earlier, I shared with you the link um, to uh, PAHO's, um, uh, PAHO's um, COVID-19 site specifically to the, um, specifically to the um, technical documents that have to do with the, um, with the clinical management. Um, and uh, what I'm going to uh, do now is I'm going to share with you also the link to the uh, documents uh, that the organization published under ethics. Um, so there's a question for you, uh, um, Ludovic. What, we, what will be some of the changes in the new WHO PAHO guidelines for the clinical management? Yeah, so uh, we, of course, will be, thanks for the question, we will, of course, will be including uh, steroids uh, as one of the of the key interventions that will be, uh, that will be recommended. Uh, otherwise, we are including some uh, questions regarding to rehabilitation. And uh, but basically, uh, reg uh, regarding therapy, we are uh, not having any different recommendation from what we had uh, so far. So we still need to have more clinical trials supporting uh, 
the use of uh, additional medications of uh, such uh, antivirals and some others, um, immunomodulators. But we know that there are a number of studies that are coming very, uh, very soon that uh, are going to provide some additional information. I will have to update. Uh, we will update our guidelines uh, once we have that uh, available information. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna. I, I want to add um, a comment uh, to that question because I think it highlights the the dynamic scenario that we're in, in which the evidence changes very rapidly. And um, if you notice that the ethics document um, that Fajo published highlighted that issue by making it clear that from an ethics review perspective from an ethics committee perspective, we're not exclusively concerned with the ethics review. We're also concerned with the ethics oversight. Because as it is the case in this situation, many, um, many, uh, in, um, many trials that could have been ethical based on the evidence we had a month ago may not be ethical now. So and the same apply the same thing applies to provision of intervention. So we have to make sure that we uh, continue to revise uh, our judgment. And uh, and as I said, that applies both in the in, in the clinical practice setting. Both uh, I mean for the three boxes in the slide above for the the research setting, the clinical practice set, practice setting, but also the MUR setting. Um, I'm going to read a question uh, for you, Ludovic. What class of intervention will the dexamethasone and steroids will be, off-label or experimental or standard of care? Uh, uh, so the recommendation of PAHO will be standard of care, but uh, based on an op for uh, critical uh, care in critical care. Uh, and it's, it's going to be a specific recommendation, and of course, there are going to be some specific issues that need to be taken into account when um, giving the medication. So WHO had access to a number of uh, results from other trials and was able to meta-analyze all that information, and based on that information, uh, the recommendation, the new recommendation uh, that we are going to to formulate, uh, we already formulated, but that we are going to publish uh, is going to be available. Now I'm talking about the PAHO recommendation and WHO is also setting uh, an update to their guideline very soon uh, for that specific recommendation as well. Thank you, Ludovic. I want to, um, the, the, the question made me think also that uh, it's relevant to share this document with you um, so we have to keep in mind that when we're talking about using off-label uh, interventions for COVID-19, it's still true that we're using interventions that are unproven for COVID-19. And WHO highlighted very early that the use of off-label medications for COVID-19 must adhere to the seven, seven criteria of the MURI framework I shared there. WHO scientific brief, then, and those are the same seven criteria that I presented uh, in, in greater detail, of course. So I think we, um, we don't have any more uh, comment um, question there's uh, um, there's uh, another question regarding the uh, I presume dexamethasone uh, um, will the dose be the dose published in the NIH panel guidelines of July 17 um, I don't know Ludovic if you yeah so as I said we have a panel and we have access to some additional data. And so based on that, we are going to set a recommendation, but it's probably going to be um, 
similar to that one, but we are still uh, formulating that recommendation. So I don't want to, it's going to be published very soon. But as I said, we have access to data from other trials and those trials uh, use different doses and different type of uh, corticosteroids. And so that that give that gave us also uh, more information. Um, and I think that based on that information, we are in a better position to formulate the recommendation and a stronger recommendation. So that's uh, what we have. And uh, as I said, we are going to present that very, very soon. Thank you for, for the question. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Ludwig. I had shared this. Uh, uh, the uh, PAHO document before I'm going to share it uh, once again because it ended up being very early in the chat. And if, unless we have any um, final comment or question, we'll proceed to um, to close uh, the session. Thank you so much for your participation. And we will be making the um, the recording of this webinar uh, public. And again, all these uh, documents of PAHO are, and, and WHO are available uh, for you at, um, at our website. Thank you uh, very much and have a, uh, have a nice day. Bye.